In this episode of Real Chemistry, we're going to start a series on naming compounds. And in this particular video, we're just going to talk about ionic compounds. So the basic problem here is, let's say we're given NaCl as a chemical formula. How do you go then to the name of that compound, which turns out to be sodium chloride? So in this video, we're going to talk about those naming rules. And again, just for ionic compounds. So the first question you might have is, what's an ionic compound? Well, basically, an ionic compound is just a mixture of a metal and a nonmetal. And if you want to know if something's a metal or a nonmetal, you can find that from its position on the periodic table. So notice that everything in blue on the periodic table over here turns out to be a metal. And the dividing line between metals and nonmetals is the stair step you see here. So everything to the left of that turns out to be metals. And everything to the right of that turns out to be nonmetals. And if you pair a metal and a nonmetal, it makes an ionic compound. And that's because metals tend to form cations, or positively charged ions. And nonmetals tend to form anions, or negatively charged uh, species. And so if I put together a metal, which is positively charged, and a nonmetal, which is negatively charged, they're held together by that difference in charge. And that makes an ionic compound. So what we're going to do is we're going to first talk about the rules for going from a chemical formula, that is, we're given something like NaCl, to the name, sodium chloride. And then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about going the other direction. So how do you name something like NaCl? Well, the first thing you're going to do is you're just going to write down the name of the metal. And so you always just write out the full name of the metal, and the name of the metal always comes first. And in this case, Na, sodium, is the metal. And so you can notice over here where we spelled out the name, we've just written sodium. And one thing that's important to remember is whenever we list an ionic compound, like NaCl, um, we always list the metal first. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to take the base name of the nonmetal, which basically just means the first syllable of our nonmetal. And our nonmetal in this case is chlorine, so all we're going to keep is the chlor part, that's the base name. And the last thing we're going to do is we're going to add the ide. And so that's how we get chloride up here. Chlor comes from the base name of chlorine, and ide is just something we tack on to the end of ionic compounds. So NaCl turns out to be sodium chloride. Let's take a look at a few more examples so you can get down this process of going from the chemical formula to the name. So let's say we have something like NaF. What do we do? Well, we need to go identify what the names are for Na and F, and we just do that based on the periodic table. So we go to the periodic table and we look up what Na is, and that turns out to be sodium. And then we're also going to look up what F is. And that turns out to be fluorine. So F is fluorine. And we're just going to keep the base name of fluorine, because that's the nonmetal. So sodium, we've already written out the name of the metal there. And the name of the nonmetal, uh, we're just going to keep the fluor part of it. So I'm going to write fluor here, and I'm going to drop the ene. And the last thing that we do here is we add ide. So that's writing down first the name of the metal, then the base name of the nonmetal, and adding ide. That's what we have to go through each time when we want to go from a chemical formula to name the name of that compound. Let's do a few more examples. Let's say we have Na with a 3 and then an N. Now that 3 means there are 3 sodium atoms in that compound, but that doesn't change how we write the name of it. So we can basically, when we're going this direction from chemical formulas to the names, we don't have to worry about the numbers written there. And what we're going to do is just the same exact thing. We're going to go look up what Na is, which again is sodium. We're going to go look up what N is on the periodic table. And N turns out to be nitrogen. We're going to keep the base name of nitrogen, which is just NITR. That's the base name of nitrogen. And we're going to add that I at the end. So it becomes sodium nitride. So sodium nitride is the name of Na3N. Let's do one more example of going from chemical formulas to the name. Let's say we have MgBr. Well, again, we're going to go to the periodic table and we're going to look up what Mg is. It turns out to be magnesium. That's our metal. Remember, we always list the metal first in ionic compounds. And then we're going to go look up what Br is. And Br turns out to be bromine. And so we just keep the base name of our nonmetal, which in this case is brome, and we're going to add ide. So we write down here next to sodium, brome, and then we add our ide. 
So that becomes magnesium bromide. So going from the chemical formula to the name is relatively straightforward. It's a little more complicated to go the other direction, to go from the name to the chemical formula. So now we're going to be given something like barium nitride, and we're going to be asked, what's the chemical formula there? The reason this is a little harder is when barium nitride is listed, it doesn't tell you how many bariums there are or how many nitrogens there are. And so we have to go through a process to figure that out. We want to know that there's three bariums and two nitrogens. And so the process we use to figure that out is basically we have to predict the charge of each of our ions, in this case barium and nitrogen, and those charges will actually tell us how many of each element type there are. And the reason this works is that all ionic compounds have to be net neutral. That is, overall, they have just as much positive charge as negative charge. And so we can use the charges on our elements then to balance it out. Let me show you what I mean. So let's say we're given sodium oxide. How do we name that? The first thing we do, step one down here, just says, write the chemical symbol for both elements. So the chemical symbol for sodium is Na, which you can get from the periodic table. We've also used it a few times in this video. The symbol for oxygen, which is just what oxide is, is O. So we have Na and O. Step two says, predict the charge of each ion. And that's where it's really important to have watched my video on predicting the charge of an ion if you don't know how to do that, you're not going to know how to do this next step. So it turns out basically the column that an element is will tell you what charge it takes on. So Na is in the first column, and an elements in the first column tend to form a positive one ion. Oxygen is way over on the other side of the periodic table, and it tends to form a negative two charge. And the last step we're going to do here is we're going to cross over the charges, and that's actually going to make sure that we have a balanced compound. So you can see here, since sodium is positive one, and oxygen is negative two, then we're gonna need two of those sodiums to pair up and make our charges neutral. And so we can just figure that process out, a shortcut to figuring that process out is just crossing over those charges. Here's what I mean. Take the sodium charge and cross it over down here to the oxygen. Take the oxygen charge and cross it over down here to the sodium. So now I'm gonna rewrite this as Na with a two and O with a one. So that two came from the fact that there was a negative two on oxygen. And that one came from the fact that there was a positive one on sodium. So sodium oxide turns out to be Na2O. And now I wrote down the one there to be clear, but usually we just, we just leave off the one. It's understood that if I write down the element O, there's at least one of them. So the one's just sort of assumed to be there. So Na2O is our final answer. Now you notice in step three I say reduce the ratio if necessary. I'll explain what I mean when we get to an example where that's necessary. All right, the next example we're going to take a look at is lithium fluoride. Again, we're going to go ahead and write the chemical symbol for both of those elements. And if we look up lithium on the periodic table, we'll see that it's Li. And if we look up fluoride or fluorine on the periodic table, we'll see that it's F. And now we have to predict their charges. Lithium is also in that first group with hydrogen, and it turns out to form a plus one ion. Fluoride is uh, in the group on the other side of the periodic table, and it tends to form a minus one charge. So now we've predicted their charges, that was step two. The last step again is cross over those charges. So I'm gonna take this one and I'm gonna put it down there. And I'm gonna take this one and I'm gonna put it down there. And that's gonna make sure the lithium fluoride's balanced. So we have Li, or neutral I should say, F. And we have a one for lithium and a one for the fluorine. Now that should make sense because lithium's positive one, fluorine's a negative one. So if I take positive one, and add it to a negative one, I get zero, or a neutral charge. And that's what we always want for ionic compounds. So now, I'm just going to erase those ones because we don't usually write them down, it's just assume. So LIF is our final answer. Okay, one more example of going from the name of a compound to the chemical formula. Barium sulfide. So again, we start with step one, which is looking up the chemical symbol for both of those guys. And we get BA for barium. And we get an S for our sulfide. That's done with the periodic table. Then we predict the charge. That's done by their position on the periodic table, as discussed in my video predicting the charge on ions. Barium turns out to be positive 2. And sulfide turns out to be negative 2. And now we do the last step, step 3, which is we cross over those charges. So this 2 comes down here. This 2 comes down there. And we get barium with a 2 there and then sulfur with it too. Now you might have said, well, wait a minute. If barium's positive two and sulfur's negative two, 
Shouldn't I just be able to put one of each together and have it be neutral? Plus two minus a two gives me zero, a neutral ion. And that's exactly right. And you can also see that if you take the ratio of the number of anions, sulfide in this case, to the number of cations, barium in this case, that it's two to two. And we can just reduce that to one to one. So whenever you have a ratio that's not in its simplest form, we can always reduce it. And that's the second part of that step three there that you need to do sometimes, but not always. And since just one barium and one sulfur turns out to be balanced, that's the simpler and correct way to write out our chemical formula. So we're gonna just get rid of those twos because we can reduce the ratio to one to one from two to two. And so that turns out to be the final answer for barium sulfide, BAS. Now, what we haven't done is talked about elements in the D block. So it turns out here we've been predicting the charge of those ions based on their position in the periodic table. Elements in the D block, which are in the middle of the periodic table, you can't predict their charges based on position. So there's slightly different rules for naming compounds in the D block. And that's the subject of my next video on naming. So go ahead and watch my next video on naming ionic compounds, which deals specifically with these elements in the D block. You also get more practice going through these rules. So thanks for watching Real Chemistry. Please ask any questions you have below or subscribe to receive updates about new videos.